Welcome back. This is Lee from the Bar Exam Toolbox. We are back today to talk about everybody's favorite topic, the MBE. Or nobody's favorite topic. Maybe when we have people who like found MBE prep programs, maybe it's their favorite topic, but basically no one else. I'll be honest, I would rather take the MBE than the essays, but I realize that's a rare you are approach. Rare, a rare approach. So many people get frustrated by this part of the exam. And today we are going to talk a little bit about how to approach an MBE question. And then we're going to take some MBE questions. Oh, I'm definitely out of practice time. on this. So that should be fun. I know, right? So first, as everyone listening likely already knows, the MBE is a one-day, 200-question multiple choice test on seven subjects, evidence, con law, torts, property, criminal law and procedure, contracts, and civil procedure. And this can be a tricky part of the test and one that frustrates a whole lot of test takers. We've been talking to people who've recently failed, and we're talking a lot about the MBE right now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So... I thought we would get started by talking a little bit about what we're seeing with folks who've struggled with the MBE and what some of our advice would be. And I think my first piece of advice is think about the questions that you're using to practice, because not all questions are created equal. Definitely. Yeah, this is also one of the things I always ask people about. And I do think it's fair to say, as we'll talk about a little later, I think some of the questions are shifting, but... Generally speaking, you want to be using licensed questions or questions based on licensed questions to prepare. So if your test provider has written all of their own questions, I might start to think that was not my best plan. Yes. And you might have to ask because they will not all, let's say, be that forthcoming about it. Right. And the reality is there are only so many questions that are licensed. Everyone licenses them. We all license the same questions. We've licensed them. But I would say that's somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 questions. I'm I don't not even sure know they... if it's that much. I think Yeah, maybe not, not even. not even that much, no. Um, but say between 1,000 and 2,000. Somewhere in there is how many questions they license. So inevitably, you know, people are writing their own if they're doing MBE prep in, you know, kind of a big way. But... You want to have as many questions as you can based on actual questions, not yeah. ones that are 100% written by somebody who's like, oh, it seems kind of like what they might ask. I don't know. Yeah. And I think that, you know, as you're selecting your MBE provider, and we really do recommend that students check out tools that are MBE specific, like Adaptabar and New World, you, re- you want to remember that you can test these out. I talk about this a lot with folks. If you feel like your MBE prep hasn't been going well, most of these tools give free trials. Go and mess around. See what you think of the questions. See what you think of the answer explanations. See what you think of the interface and decide what is best for you. So often I think we forget in bar prep land that you can actually shop around. Oh, yeah. And people always ask me, well, which one should I use? I'm like, well, you should try them out and see. I can't tell you. I can't tell you which one you're going to like best. Some have more visual explanations than others. Try it out. Give it a shot. At that point, really, what do you have to lose? At least you're practicing questions. Yeah, I know. So that is something that I think gets lost a lot of the time is that you can just see you have some wisdom. You have sat for this test possibly before, so you have some experience. Right. I think there's a lot of value in having data. So if you use Adaptive RU World, you're going to get data on how you're doing on certain types of questions. And so when we look at a score report after the fact, particularly if you've taken it more than once, oftentimes there are patterns in how you're doing on different areas of the MBE. I say, oh, you know, is property usually a a weak area for you? Oh, yeah, it is. But you need to figure that out beforehand so that you can see, okay, I'm getting 70% right of evidence questions. I'm getting 30% right in property. One of those probably needs more attention than the other. And that's really the easiest way to get the score to improve. So I think that data is super valuable. Yeah, I agree. One of the other things we often talk to students about the MBE is how many questions do you really have to do? And this might sound like a silly thing, but we hear all sorts of reports. I mean, I've heard I did 400 practice questions. Isn't that a lot? And I'm like, no, that is not. No, that's my favorite question. So people say, oh, you know, uh, how much practice did you do? I did a lot of MBE questions. Okay, give me a rough estimate. I mean, at least four or 500. Right. Like, that's not a lot. That's not a lot. It's like, 
We're looking at thousands, thousands. Yeah, two to three thousand is what I would yeah. consider to be not even really a lot. I mean, that's kind of what you need to be doing. If you above three thousand, I don't even know where you're finding those questions. But good for you because that is a lot. Yeah. So, you know, I think that just sitting with thousands can be really intimidating for folks. But one of the things that you want to think about is how many weeks that you're studying. I mean, if you're studying for 10 weeks, which is the typical way to study for the bar exam, 2,000 questions over 10 weeks isn't that much. No, 200 questions a week. You can break that down by day. That's about 30 questions a day. If you're doing them seven days a week, I mean, that's still like, that's a decent amount of time, but you should be able to do that in what, like three hours? Yeah. Three hours, maybe four with review time. Yeah. Um, So half your day. Yeah. Oh, but not, I mean, 30 questions is going to take like an hour and change because you can only take like an hour and change for them. Right. Oh yeah, you're right. I've got my math off. I was like, right. Because you're doing a hundred questions in three hours. So 30 questions should take you about an hour. Sorry, not doing math beforehand here. If you think that you're giving this part of the test a couple hours a day, you know, maybe an hour to do the questions, an hour to give yourself feedback and evaluation, I mean, that's fine. That's, I mean, it's it's half of the test. Right. It should be half of the day. So I think that that should be reasonable. So if it feels unreasonable, breaking it down by daily goals, I think, is very helpful. The right. other thing that we see a lot of folks doing is they will say things to me like, I did thousands of them. And I'll say, great. Did you ever evaluate your strengths and weaknesses? And they're like, well, I did thousands of them. And I'm like, cool. That just tells you that you did them. But what did you learn from them? And I think that, you know, you really want to be interacting with these questions, especially the early part of your prep. We were doing these 30, 33 questions a day. And you want to start tracking. If you're getting them wrong, like, why are you getting them wrong? And... If you're getting it right, did you get it right for the right reason? Or did you get it right and just be like, oh, and then you move on? It's so typical. Right. Because oftentimes people tell me, oh, I'm guessing between two answers, which really should not happen because you should have an answer in your head before you look at the answer choices, as we've discussed in detail and go over in detail in our Practice the Week course, where we spent a lot of time going through MBE questions and realized there's always a correct answer. Anyway. People tell me like, oh, you know, I get down yes or no, and then I'm guessing. It's like, great, you guessed right. That doesn't really tell us that much. Maybe you guessed wrong on the same topic the next time. Yeah, so I would rather see people really take time with these. Maybe even in the beginning, do some open book ones to really test, you know, can I get this right as a process if I have the law in front of me? Um, There are a lot of different strategies you can use, but just kind of like doing the question, guessing on it getting it correct and moving on is probably not really your best return on investment here. No, I mean, I have now studied the MBE. I studied for the bar. I can pretty much tell you what my weaknesses are. Yeah, I know. I tend to read too fast. I am very easily distracted by delicious looking, distracting answer choices. I get very into the answer choices. And I think that goes back to when I used to tutor for the SATs and you could really use your answer choices to figure out kind of more of the answer. And I don't think that really serves you as much on the MBE. But those are hard habits to break. And you throw me an MBE question. And if I'm not thoughtful about it, I'll get it wrong. Right. I mean, these questions are very tricky and they are extremely good at writing answers that look good. Even in preparation for this podcast, I read the first question we're getting ready to read and I totally got it wrong because I'd skipped a word, you know, and I was just like skimming it really quickly. And I was like, yeah, totally clear on that. I'm like, oh, that is not right at all. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think you have to retrain your brain to really do a different process on these than you might have done on other standardized tests, because I do think the answer choices are so distracting that you need to have a clear idea what you're looking for. A hundred percent. Um, lastly, you mentioned it earlier, we're getting some interesting feedback from students about what they're seeing on the MBE. And we were having a bit of a chat about this on our Tutor Slack channel <laughs> where we all talk to each other. So you want to share what we've been hearing from students who are our boots on the ground? Yeah, super interesting. I remember last week I talked to two people back to back who told me almost word for word the same thing. And then our tutor, one of them brought it up a few days ago. And I was like, oh, yeah, I've definitely have heard that. So People might be aware the bar exam is changing. There's the next-gen bar exam. 
And it seems like they are starting to field test some of these questions on the actual MBE. And these questions look different. So they're not the standard, you know, here's a hypo, yes or no reason, four choices. Um, You can go look some of these up. We've talked about them some on different podcasts, but they're basically more of a scenario type thing. Like you're a defense attorney and a client comes into your office and, you know, they ask this question and what other pieces of information might you need to figure out the answer or something along those lines. And people are really getting thrown by these. You know, they haven't seen them before. It's freaking people out, honestly. Um, I mean, it's hard to say if these are graded or not. I suspect they're not. But I think people should just go and look at some of these questions, kind of be aware that they might be showing up in this format. And then you can kind of assume, okay, maybe this is a test question. It's not being graded. I probably wouldn't spend a ton of time on them. I'd give it my best shot and maybe move on and save that minute somewhere else. But I think the key is just really to be aware that might be happening and not freak out if you see one of these. Yeah. The not freak out part, I think, is the biggest piece here is you got to do your best and then move on. It's really throwing people off because they're like, I have never seen anything like this before. And they tend to be a little more conceptual. So people, you know, said to me, I I didn't even know what law they were testing. I had no idea what they were even asking me. I just sat there kind of looking at it thinking, oh, my God. I mean, if you get a question that's really weird, and I've always thought this on any standardized test, if you get something that just seems absolutely out of left field, it is probably a question that they're testing and maybe don't even end up using. Yeah. And... You know, statistically, one or two of these wacky questions, even if they are graded, are not going to make a huge difference in your score. And one of your jobs is to stay on task and do the best job that you can on the whole entire test. And so you can't let one or two questions just tank your confidence or really unsettle you because you're looking for this overall performance and you always have to hold that passing the MBE feels kind of like failing any other right. test. No, I remember the first day I took the MBE for the first bar exam I set for. And like I said, I'm like pretty good at standardized tests. I walked out of there and almost did not get back for the second day. Oh, yeah. I had to call my friend from law school and he had to give me a pep talk. And he's like, look, that sucked. It sucked for everybody. It was terrible. You still have to go to day two. I know. I think I've told the story on the podcast before, but I went up to my hotel room at lunch on the MBE day. And in California, it was three days when I sat for the California bar and messaged my, I think I was a, still a text message. Maybe I had an f- iPhone then. I don't think I even had an iPhone. This no, like not yet. IPhone. Not yeah. yet. No. And, but I sent like one of the like AAA or ABC, you know, where you're like doing the thing. And I think I just said, well, it's over. I failed. And so, of course, he called me being quite nervous. And, I said, it was so bad. Like, what am I going to do? You know, because I think almost everyone has that feeling because we're not used to taking tests where a successful score is basically failing. Right. 70% is like a pretty solid MBE score. Yeah. And most of us aren't going for 70% on things. No. I mean, most of your life, if you got 70% on a test, that was not going to get you the A. (laughs) No, exactly. (laughs) So you do really have to play the mental part of the MBE, which I think is also really, really important. The last thing I wanted to mention is that one thing I've heard a few times is people who failed the MBE telling me that time management was not a problem. Huh. They're like, it's not a problem because I finished the test with time to spare. I was like, but you didn't pass it. So then you went too fast, which is a separate time management problem. So I right. do think that sometimes we just talk about time management as in you didn't have time to finish the test. But I think it's important to also remember that being unsuccessful and having extra time is also poor time management. Right. If somebody tells me they end every session of the MBE with 20 to 30 minutes to spare, I wonder why. Yeah. So anyway, food for thought. All right. Well, I'm sure everyone is super excited to listen to us talk about real MBE questions. (laughs) So these questions are pulled from the free National Conference of Bar Examiners questions that are published online. We will link to the website on the show notes so you can look them up yourself. As we walk through these questions, keep in mind that this is not as tightly done as we do in our Practice of the Week program. But this idea of kind of picking apart questions and focusing on how you walk through a question is what we do in our Practice of the Week program, um, which is a 
MBE supplementary course that you can check out on our website. So that is what we like to do with MBE questions is really walk through them and kind of talk our way through them. So we're going to try. It's going to be fun. Are you ready, Allison? I'm ready. Do you want me to read the first one? I'll get started. Sure. You All just right. get started. Let's jump in. All right. A daughter was appointed guardian of her elderly father following an adjudication of his mental incompetence. The father had experienced periods of dementia, during which he did not fully understand what he was doing. The father later contracted to purchase an automobile at a fair price from a seller who was unaware of the guardianship. At the time of the purchase, the father was lucid and fully understood the nature and purpose of the transaction. What is the legal status of the transaction? A. The contract is enforceable because a reasonable person in the situation of the seller would have thought that the father had the capacity to make the contract. B. The contract is enforceable because it was made on fair terms and the seller had no knowledge of the fa father's guardianship. C. The contract is void because the father was under guardianship at the time it was made. And D. The contract is voidable at the option of the father. I will say this question made me realize and remember how much I hate contract law. I, I knew that. When I put this in there, I was like, Allison's going to hate that I included this contract. Law honestly, I'm like, you know what? Any of those answers seem like they could be right to me. So, like this was a short answer type of a question. I think one of the things that is important to do with the MBE is always just think about what is the law that you need to know. So before you start to spin out about the answer choices, you want to think about what is the law. And here, the law we're talking about is really about capacity. Did the father have the capacity to enter into a contract and have the contract be enforceable? And, you know, there's not like a ton of law on this on your bar outline, to be honest. Like, there's not a ton. But when I think about capacity, I usually think about a child, the fact that like a young child does not have the capacity to contract. So the law that I you know, I went to my bar outlines and like looked it up. It's like the rule really is that someone must have capacity to make a contract. But I like to think of this idea as if, if somebody is under guardianship and basically the court has said you don't have the capacity to do things, it's like they're a minor child. And right. a minor child like can't make a contract. So that is one of the ways that I thought about this question. And if this was a child, I don't think the child could buy the car even if the child looked like they were 21 or 18. And so that made me kind of lean in that direction um, that, you know, that that was the situation here. Now, the one thing I did see, though, that kind of made me pause was the fact that they threw in, see, this is where it gets all distracting, was that the father was elusive during the transaction. And I think they did that just like to mix it up for you. Right. No, I mean, that probably would have gotten me because when you think about it the way you think about it, the answer is super clear. Well, the father's mm -hmm. under guardianship. He can't contract. All right. Great. See, it's void. Um, you know, like that, this is not a hard question, actually. I probably would have gotten distracted by it. You know, the fact that it was. So my initial reaction was like, oh, yeah, A is great. I love that answer. But then if you look at A and B, and this is kind of a test taking tip, those basically say the same thing. So they can't both be right. Mm -hmm. So if you see something like that, you're like, oh, I can't choose between those because they're saying the same thing. It's like the answer is probably elsewhere on the page. Yeah. But you can also see that if before you dove into those answer choices, if you just ask yourself, is this an enforceable contract or not? And you think about the guardianship and you're like, there's no way this guy could have made this contract. Well, already then you're into C and D. Right, exactly. And your answer is right there sitting on the page waiting for you to pick it and move on. Right, because also D which is the contract is voidable at the option of the father. Well, that still sounds like that the father's allowed to make a choice. Right. And the court has already determined that the father can't take make choices anymore. Right. And also the contract can't be voidable because the contract doesn't exist. Right. They can't. Yeah. There's no there's no contracts. <laughs> he didn't have the capacity to make the contract. Right. All right. So let's run through our answer choices. So A was not the right choice because incapacity is just is not about the seller. <laughs> it's about the buyer. So that's that was really, like you said, it was kind of off. Um, and the same issue shows up in B. And as you said, they kind of say the same thing. So they they just feel very squishy. It's not a good direction to go in. C aligns with my rules. So I would hold C as what I thought would be the right answer. But I would want to check with D. And the problem with D is that the father has the option to void. 
but that's not how guardianship works. So right. because I have the option to do anything. Is, one of the things that I think is important to think about here is that we didn't really know that much rule or we didn't know right. that much law. It was just this idea that a guardianship means somebody doesn't have capacity and then we applied it to the fact pattern. And I think that what so often gets lost on the multiple choice is this idea that you can't practice until you have like all this law, like hardcore memorize all the nuances because they're not always testing that much law. They're often testing something very little. This is really just reasoning, keeping the public policy in mind that the reason we have something like guardianship is that somebody doesn't have the capacity to make contracts. Yeah, this was kind of a classic MBE question because it's actually a very easy question, but the answer choices make it seem really hard if you just focus on those. Yep. All right, well, let's move on to property law, which everybody loves too. I know. Okay, two sisters own a single tract of land as tenants in common, each holding a one-half interest. The younger sister entered into a three-year written lease with a tenant, the lease described with meets and bounds a specified portion of the land, which consisted of about 40% of the total tract. The tenant went into sole possession of the leased portion of the land. The older sister has sued both the younger sister and the tenant to establish the older sister's right to possession of the leased portion of the land. Who is likely to prevail? A. The older sister, because the younger sister cannot unilaterally partition the land without the older sister's consent. B. The older sister, because the younger sister may not lease her undivided interest in the land without her older sister's consent. C. The younger sister and the tenant, because the older sister has been excluded only from the specified portion of the land subject to the lease, which makes up less than one half of the land's total area. Or D. The younger sister and the tenant, because the younger sister's lease to the tenant was necessary for less than a fee simple interest. I mean, that one just sounds weird, but we could get to that in a minute. Right. So, yeah. Yay, property law. (laughs) Yes. Another one that no one really loves. But again, I actually, having recently done a real estate transaction that was, I don't know, I can't remember, not a tenancy in common. Anyway, basically, you've got to know the the TIC rules here. So, Lee, what are those? A tenancy in common is the default estate created when land is conveyed to two or more people unless... A, express language states that the parties have a survivorship right, creating a joint tenancy, or B, if conveyed as husband and wife, creating a tenancy by the entirety. Each owner owns an undivided interest in the property and has the right to use and enjoy the entire property. Ding, 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 ding. That should be triggering some bells in your head. Yes. So... If we then, again, this is not complicated law, right? All you really have to remember is two people buy land together, they become tenants in common, and they both get to, like, have a right to possess the land. Yeah, the key is the undivided interest. Right, exactly. So when we go back to our fact pattern, and we think about this as like a short answer question, given that little fact that came out of our outline, who's going to win here? Because someone's being excluded... And I think it's the older sister, and she's one of the tenants in common. And so it seems like she's going to probably win this one. Yeah, exactly. So basically, if you remember the basic rule around a tenancy in common, which is not super complicated, again, you should be thinking, huh, I don't think the younger sister is allowed to do that. (laughs) And why? So you're like, okay, cool. So that gets us into the realm of A or B. But why is she not allowed to do that? And it's because she cannot unilaterally partition that land because they have an undivided interest. It's literally there in the definition. Yeah. So you can't do it unless older sister wants to do it. (laughs) And even if you don't really know that rule, I mean, option A is the older sister because the younger sister cannot unilaterally partition the land without the older sister's consent. So maybe you have a moment where you're like, I don't know if she can give consent. So I'm going to think about that one. But then you compare it to option B, which is the older sister, because the younger sister may not lease her undivided interest in the land without the older sister's consent. I mean, and they're a little close to each other, but I think that when you really think about it and you think about the rule, which is that they have an undivided... They actually tell you in answer choice B, so maybe that should trigger 
undivided. Is she trying to divide it? I think she's trying mm-hmm. to divide it. Oh, yeah. okay. Not allowed. Done. Right. Done. Right. So that's where you really get into option A, the older sister, because the younger sister cannot unilaterally partition the land without the older sister's consent because they are tenants in common, which means they have the same rights to the land. Right. They each have a right to undivided possession, basically. Yeah. So again, what struck me about this question was the rule was super short when I went to go look it up. There wasn't that much law. Again, see, we get suckered into thinking that it's all about this nuance of the law. But uh, if you only remembered the part that they own an undivided interest and they have the right to use and enjoy the entire property, that's all the law you needed to know. Which, I mean, frankly, is, I think, pretty much the case with all joint tendencies. I mean, I think so. Anyway, don't trust us on that. But I know. (laughs) I didn't refresh my recollection on that law. So I won't be quoting that law. But anyway, point being, the rule is very simple, actually, and you just have to think about it and think through it logically and apply it. Yes. Now, I will say I would like to call out our option D, which was the one that Ted said fee simple interest, which was really out of left field. And this is something that they do sometimes is they just throw in a legal term so you can get distracted by a term of art. Right, because we all remember the fee simple absolute. That means you have like absolute right to the property. And so, you know, some people might say, like, oh, I have no idea what the answer is, but a fee simple is important. Right. This is the example of the answer choice that my old physics professor in high school used to describe as true but irrelevant. It is actually yeah. the case that, yes, her interest is necessarily less than fee simple, but that has nothing to do with anything. Here. Nothing to do with it. I know. So it's also really important to just not get distracted by rules that you may know because you're like, I know what a fee simple is, so I'm going to choose answer D. Go with that one. Yeah, we used to get answer. Our test would be back with TBI written beside of things. True but irrelevant. All right. Do you want to pick up number three? Sure. A state law prohibits any barbershop licensed by the state from displaying posters in support of any current candidate for public office or displaying or distributing any campaign literature in support of such a candidate. No other kinds of posters or literature are subject to this prohibition, nor are any other types of commercial establishments in the state subject to similar prohibitions. Is this law constitutional? All righty. I mean, your gut should be like, probably uh, not. Hell no. (laughs) But we got to figure out why. All right. (laughs) Well, if we think about this. Oh, sorry. You you were going to read the the choices. choices. Yeah. Yes. I I was immediately like, nope, but I don't know why. Um, Let me see what they're giving me. No, because it treats barbershops differently from other commercial establishments. B. No, because it imposes a restriction on the content or subject matter of speech in the absence of any evidence that such a restriction is necessary to serve a compelling state interest. C. Yes, because it leaves political candidates free to communicate their campaign messages to voters by other means. Or D. Yes, because the operation of a licensed barbershop is a privilege and is therefore subject to any reasonable restriction imposed by the state. All right, well... We're in kind of a messy area of condol here. Oh, First um, Amendment. Oh, man. Tell this ya. is an example of why you really need to understand and know by heart the different levels of scrutiny. Yes. And I also think around speech like this, you really want to always think about like content-based and content-neutral. Because when I read this fact pattern, the first thing that jumps out to me is, well, it sounds like they're restricting the content of the speech. Right. So they're kind of doing two things, right? Because there's the content-based restriction, and then there's also this kind of red herring of that mm-hmm. the barbershops are being treated differently than something like a coffee shop. Right. So, but again, you can also see that this is the second time that like a red herring has showed up at the end of the fact pattern, like with our dad example, right? Because the whole thing about like the dad felt great the day that right. he signed the contract. That fact was also at the end of the fact pattern. So when you do lots of these questions, you start to see the patterns of how they build them and where some of these red herrings might be. 
even though this is a messy area of the law, there are certain rules that we can pull out of hopefully our brain in the exam room or in the, our outline if it's for studying. And so the first thing for me that I went to go check was what are the rules around content-based restrictions? I know that that's no, no, not good. We don't, we don't like right. to do that. We don't like right. that. We that, don't that, like that, that generally. That's what gets us to the mm, definitely not legal. Right, right. And so when we really don't like that, they're going to be subject to strict, strict scrutiny, which we remember is the strictest of the scrutinies. I mean, that's really the worst explanation I actually used to teach con law uh, study groups. Anyway, it's the strictest of the scrutinies. It is the highest level of protection, basically. Right. So you will remember that the strict scrutiny rule is that the government must show that the right Regulation is narrowly tailored to achieve a compelling government interest using the least restrictive means. I think that what's interesting about that is it should start to ring some words that align with some of the words that you see in these answer choices. So basically, when we take that law and we apply it to the fact pattern, do we think that they can do this or not? No. I mean, obviously, we don't have a ton of facts here, but nothing in what they have provided is showing me that it's particularly narrowly tailored, that it is to achieve a compelling government interest, or that it's the least restrictive means. So if we don't see any of that in this very short hypo, I'm going to guess it is not going to meet the strict scrutiny requirement. 100%. So then we know that two of the answer choices say that it is not constitutional. So option A says no because it treats barbershops differently from other commercial establishments. I mean, that's like not good either but but i'm gonna think to my yeah i mean i'm thinking okay that's not great but would i allow this regulation to be constitutional in a coffee shop no so it doesn't really right. matter yeah exactly that's not really what the core of the problem here is and if we remember remember from all sorts of equal protection and arguments about one class of groups being treated by others differently I don't think barbershops are a protected class. If you're always wanting the analysis that's going to get you the highest level of scrutiny, barbershops, unless I'm really rusty on my con law, do not get any sort of special protections. I don't think so. And I yeah. think one of the key things here is that this is political speech. If you remember mm -hmm. nothing else about the U.S. Constitution, you should remember that it is pretty protective of political speech. Yeah. All right. So then we go to option B. No, because it imposes a restriction on the content, ding, 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 ding. or subject matter of ding, the speech <laughs> in absence of any evidence that such a restriction is necessary to serve a compelling state interest. I mean, these are words that are in the rule statement that you have learned. So that should feel very familiar to you. And you should say, oh, well, this answer choice isn't just throwing me legal terms of art. It's describing the strict scrutiny rule like rule <laughs> that i have memorized and so i'm going to pick that one so that one is our correct answer so what i liked about this question and why i thought we should include it in our exercise today was because it shows that when you do memorize the law with those terms of art then it becomes a lot clearer when you see that law reflected on an answer choice for you to be able to say like boom that's the strict scrutiny analysis right there and that's what this question is really about Right, exactly. I think the con law stuff that trips people up sometimes is remembering those levels of scrutiny and what they mean. But honestly, it's kind of the easy part of con law. Like once you memorize yeah. those, those show up over and over and over again on the MBE. Yes. And they are not that hard. Yep. It's totally true. And I think especially when you start to remember examples of what is strict scrutiny and what is intermediate scrutiny and what is rational basis, it also helps with this. Even my con law has a tiny bit of rust on it, but I can still tell you that rule for strict scrutiny, but also I have that gut reaction of this is content-based speech restrictions and that's not going to be good. I had not it's even good. read this question before we started this recording and my immediate reaction as I'm reading it out loud is my brain is going, uh-uh, not constitutional. No. Definitely Can't do not. That. Can't Cannot do that. do that. Cannot do that. No. And I think that's one of the reasons why you want to do a lot of practice, because the more of these questions you see, the more it gets ingrained into you that you kind of have that gut reaction, you know, because you get familiar with these fact patterns, they can only get so creative. And then maybe the next 
fact pattern that's testing similar rules, it's a content neutral restriction. And then that may have a different analysis. And why is one thing content based and why is something content neutral? So that's why you want to do a lot of this practice and learn from the practice because it really helps you get comfortable with these fact patterns. Right. And then, I mean, honestly, you can barely even pay attention to C&D because you're like, this is obviously not constitutional. But even then, I guess maybe some people will get tripped up like, oh, the licensed barbershop. Oh, it is a license. Okay, the state can do whatever it wants. No, that's not true. It's not the law. Like, that's not in, like a heavily tested area of the law. It's not what this question's about. And I think that's that's the thing is sometimes you have to take a step back and be like, what is this question about? This question is about content Political speech. speech. Political content political speech. Political content highest based. level. If you remember yes. nothing else, political speech most protected. Yes, exactly. So I think sometimes you can just go with your gut and say, what is this question about? And that's going to lead you to the answer. So, yeah. well, with that, we're running low on time, but boy, wasn't that fun. It was so, so fun. fun. So Give me fun. some more MBE questions online I, I haven't looked at for many a long time. Totally. So if you enjoyed walking through questions with us, you can check out our Practice of the Week program, which is linked to on our Bar Exam Toolbox website, which does something similar. It walks you through MBE questions while giving you the law and really showing you how to do the analysis piece, which I think is the part that most people really need to work on. We can all look up law, but really getting comfortable with these questions and how they are executed is a very specific skill. And we believe that it will make you more successful on the MBE. So we hope you found this exercise helpful. Right. And the other thing I like about PAL, which we did, is we include a question for you to practice on right after you watch us go through a question on similar law. So hopefully mm -hmm. you can see us apply it and then do it yourself and get that question right and start building some confidence, which I think is yeah. a really big piece of the MBE, just believing that you actually can do this. And if nothing else, I hope this podcast today has shown you that a lot of this law is not actually that complicated. I know. It just feels really complicated because the there's test so itself is hard. There's well, so and much. there's so much law. But like yeah. each, individual, each individual rule here, and I don't think you picked these because they had easy rules. I think most of them, I mean, a lot of them are actually just sort of easy rules. Yeah. It's just the way that they're, you know, implemented into these questions becomes a challenge. So And the amount, you know, the volume of rules. Well, yeah. If you had to remember 10, no big deal. If you have to remember hundreds, it becomes a lot harder to keep right. everything straight and remember exactly what those levels of scrutiny are or what exactly a joint tenancy versus a tenancy in common. But, you know, this is all the stuff that you got to learn. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us today and playing along as we walked through multiple choice questions. Um, you can check out the Bar Exam Toolbox website for more about our um, practice of the week program and you should subscribe to this youtube channel if you want to see future content for help on the bar exam all right everybody thanks for joining us we'll talk soon